Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, I apologize for starting a few minutes late. We got caught in our forum discussion, but we will be starting momentarily. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we have it. This October 25, 25th, 2018 regular meeting of the Fairfax County School Board will now come to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and the performance of the National Anthem by the Herndon High School Chamber Orchestra under the direction of Alexandra Tuzinski. Thank you so much. The board held a closed meeting earlier this evening and certified compliance immediately upon reconvening in public at the forum work session, which preceded tonight's regular meeting. A few other announcements before we begin tonight's meeting. If you would like to review a copy of the agenda and any agenda item that is being discussed tonight, that information is available on the table by the auditorium entrance. Tonight's agenda is available by going to the school board on the FCPS homepage and selecting board docs under upcoming school board meetings. The meeting is also being streamed live online. Select school board from the full menu, then click on the watch live button on the school board meetings webpage. Please turn off or silence your cell phones. And I am going to uh, inform my colleagues that tonight we are having a problem with the toggle switches. And so if you would like to speak, please raise your hand and make sure I see you. Um, so that I can uh, acknowledge you or recognize you. So I now call on Mr. Tigner for announcements. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's National Red Ribbon, Ribbon Week from October 23rd to 31st, 2018. Uh, National Red Ribbon Week was established in memory of Enrique Camarena, a U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration agent who was killed in the line of duty while investigating a ma major drug cartel in Mexico. To honor his battle against illegal drugs, friends and neighbors began to wear red badges of satin and some uh, parents began to form coalitions. National Red Ribbon Week grew from these grassroots efforts to form a national movement against the use of illegal drugs. Its annual campaign encourages students to take a visible stand against substance abuse and make a personal commitment to follow a drug-free lifestyle. The 2018 Red Ribbon theme is, Life is Your Journey, Travel Drug-Free. Native uh, American Heritage Month is also November. Uh, so Native American Heritage Month started in 1915 as American Indian Day by the Boy Scouts of America. Over the years, individual states recognized Native American days, but it wasn't until 1990 that President George H.W. Bush designated November as National American Indian Heritage Month. Since 1994, a presidential proclamation has proclaimed the month to be Native American Heritage Month in honor of the significant contributions made by the first Americans to the establishment and growth of the U.S. Thank you. I now will call on Ms. Schultz for a recognition of National Career Development Month. November 2018 is National Career and Development Month. Career Center Specialists, School Counselors, Career Experience Specialists, Employment and Transition Representatives, and Career and Transition Teachers play unique roles in career development for students. With a focus on readiness for post-secondary education and careers, these educators are employed to help students explore and develop their abilities, interests, strengths, and talents as they relate to further education and entry into the workforce. These educators collaborate with parents to enhance academic and career planning for students. All educators in pre-K through 12 help students to investigate skills, qualities, and academic opportunities that relate to career fields, encourage lifelong learning, and promote future readiness. Students explore careers and post-secondary options through classroom instruction, the student learning plan, academic advising, work-based learning, and related activities. Through career awareness activities, exploration, and development, students learn the skills and training necessary to be successful in future careers and achieve gainful employment and personal fulfillment. Career development activities are essential for future careers and achieve gainful employment for building a portrait of a graduate for all of our students. At this time, I would like to invite staff from the Instructional Services Department to please join us at the dais for a photo with the board. Come on down.
now call on Ms. Evans for the resolution regarding the renaming of the Bryn Mawr Park Book Room. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I am delighted to be uh, reading this resolution on behalf of the Bryn Mawr Park community uh, to rename uh, renaming resolution. Whereas Rhonda Sweet served with distinction as a reading teacher in Fairfax County Public Schools for 12 years, in between her family's overseas military assignments and worked in several FCPS elementary schools to include Mantua, Bryn Mawr Park, Woodlawn, and Crestwood, returning to Glen Bryn Mawr Park Elementary almost a decade later to continue her wonderful work with the students. And whereas Mrs. Sweet had a zest for teaching and life and would share wonderful stories of her travels overseas, often serving as a travel guru for staff members' vacations and promoted a family atmosphere at Bryn Mawr Park through her inclusivity, compassion, and encouragement. And whereas her knowledge and passion for teaching were unsurpassed and she willingly shared those strengths with her colleagues as she trained and guided them through new curricula, through the selection of the perfect book for each student, and through collaborative classroom teaching to ensure the best instruction for all students, always with her favorite incentive, let's do it together. And whereas, above all else, Mrs. Sweet cared deeply for the education and well-being of her students and believed no student was unreachable, that every child could learn if you believe in them, get to know their strengths as learners and build their confidence around what they can do, which she did with patient listening and individualized attention so that every student felt they were the most special in her eyes. And whereas Mrs. Sweet modeled these best practices consistently in her words and deeds, and in her actions always put her students' needs first, building their confidence as she helped them conquer challenges that had seemed insurmountable while nurturing a love for reading as they worked together in the Bryn Mawr Park book room. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board names the book room at Bryn Mawr Park Elementary the Rhonda Sweet Book Room in honor of this exemplary educator, mentor, and friend who instilled a love of reading in her students and opened new worlds to them through reading. I so move. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Evans, would you like to speak to your motion? I would just like to say that I so appreciate the Bryn Mawr Park community bringing uh, this forward. Uh, this is clearly such a, a spe special educator who made a, a huge impact on the lives of, of so many students in our community. So uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity and um, I look forward to visiting very soon the Rhonda Sweet Book Room. Ms. Schultz, would you like to speak to your second? There's nothing better than it being called the sweet book room. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other board members like to speak to this resolution? Okay, so we'll take the vote. All those in favor? And that motion passes unanimously. At this time... At this time, I would like to invite uh, members of the Bryn Mawr Park community, uh, former principal Jason Panuti, who I see in the audience, and I don't know if interim principal Pam Morgan is here uh, or not, but if you would all come up to uh, join us at the dais and uh, um, uh, for a photo with the board, that would be great.
I am now passing the gavel over to the Vice Chair, Mr. Moon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I call on Mrs. Corbett Sanders for the resolution. This is a resolution honoring the 50th anniversary of Riverside Elementary School. Whereas in 2018, Riverside Elementary School will proudly celebrate the 50th anniversary of its founding and its reputation for providing students with an excellent academic foundation so that they may embark on their futures fully prepared with the critical thinking skills, global and environmental awareness, ethics, sense of citizenship, and problem solving skills and Whereas Riverside Elementary School first opens its, opened its doors in the fall of 1968 and was built on land that was formerly part of Muddy Hole Farm, one of five farms that comprised President George Washington's Mount Vernon estate and Whereas Riverside Elementary School's vision is to foster self-efficacy and a growth mindset in their school community and to develop ethical and responsible citizens who demonstrate superlative effort and attitude, engage in lifelong learning, and effectively contribute to the global community. And whereas Riverside Elementary School nurtures a safe and supportive learning environment that promotes high academic and social achievement for all students and meets the needs of all learners through meaningful instruction and works collaboratively with colleagues and parents to support student learning and Whereas Riverside Elementary School is proud to have a diverse, multicultural, multilingual community and a robust after school program that includes co curricular and extracurricular programs and activities that nurture the love of learning for all students at Riverside Elementary. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board honors Riverside Elementary School on the occasion of its 50th anniversary and commends its history of providing educational excellence and enrichment opportunities to the students and community. I so move. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Arkofax? Second. Mrs. Corbett Sanders, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I will be brief though. Riverside Elementary School represents all that is good in our school system and in Mount Vernon itself. It is a loving and nurturing environment that is both socially, socially and economically diverse and provides an excellent educational experience for all students. It is a probably the most diverse advanced academic center in the county, as well as um, a incredible experience for students from the local community to come in and thrive. And so I am just so proud to be able to present this resolution and I'm particularly proud to um, acknowledge the principal and his staff for being here tonight because they are a dream team. Um, I don't want to embarrass them, but they are certainly best in class. So um, thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Mr. Arakofax, to your second. I can't add much more than that. We're just so grateful to have you as part of our FCPS family. Um, now that your school is 50 years old, we uh, can't wait to see what's gonna happen in the next 50 years. So thank you all for all that you do. Thank you, Mr. Narakofax. Any other board member? I know that I'm gonna be around for the next 50 years, so exciting. <laughs> if not, uh, let's take the vote. All those in favor, raise your hand. Vote is unanimous with a Mr. Wilson absent. The motion passes. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to invite Principal Paul Bazdekis and his staff to join me at the dais for a photo with the board.
I now call on Ms. Palchik for a recognition. Thank you. It is uh, my honor and privilege to read this recognition for one of our wonderful community partners. On behalf of the Fairfax County School Board, it is an honor for me to recognize Educación para Nuestro Futuro, better known as EduFuturo, for the longstanding and deep support of students in Fairfax County Public Schools and their families, and as a celebration of 20 years as an engaged community-based not-for-profit. Based in Arlington and Fairfax counties and founded in 1998, Edu Futuro's mission is to empower low-income Latinx and other immigrant youth through education, leadership development, and engagement of their families to become the next generation of successful professionals who transform their communities. Our school system's relationship with Edu Futuro started in August of 2015 in a partnership with Robinson Secondary School, where Edu Futuro began serving middle and high school students in a pilot leadership program. From 25 students at Robinson to a new Ignite Level system-wide partnership with the FCPS Office of Family Partnerships, Edu Futuro is now serving 300 students in their leadership program alone. With eight full-time staff, over 30 part-time staff, seven AmeriCorps members, and hundreds of volunteers, Edu Futuro contributed almost 19,000 hours of service to Fairfax families. Along with supporting and empowering our immigrant and Latinx students and families through education and leadership development, Edu Futuro specifically supports, mentors, and, and provides support in mentoring and workforce development programs, robotics clubs, college and career readiness, including scholarships, and parent empowerment services now at multiple FCPS middle and high schools. Edu Futuro employees and volunteers have dedicated their time, energy, and resources to helping Latinx students adapt to life in the United States while also teaching the broader community about the important contributions of immigrants to the U.S. While many community organizations play a crucial role in supporting our students, families, and schools, Edu Futuro's long-standing support is to be recognized. Thank you for empowering students and engaging parents. Your exceptional work transforms communities and it has for 20 years. These achievements are a testament to your dedication, talents, and hard work. We wish you continued success and growth and all the best in your endeavors. At this time, I would like to invite Jorge Figueredo, Executive Director, along with his staff, Stacy Cooper, Emily Sanis Kutlicic, sorry, I almost got it, uh, Paola Sa uh, Sandoval Moschenberg, and the students, America members, and all who are here this evening to join us at the dais for a picture with the board.
The next order of business is citizen participation. Tonight, five citizens have, I'm sorry, seven citizens have signed up to address the board. Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to no more than three minutes. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings such as capital improvement program, budget, and boundaries. Complaints regarding individual students or school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school official. Speakers should refrain from using personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student. Speakers are expected to deliver their comments with the decorum and respect appropriate to the conduct of the public's business. Please be mindful that there are often young children in attendance at these meetings and or watching at home, so language should be appropriate at all late age levels. Thank you for your cooperation, and thanks to those who have come to speak to us tonight. Our first speaker this evening is Amanda Brewer, followed by Robert Rigby and Jenny Bai. Hello, and thank you for giving me a chance to speak again tonight. I'm Amanda Brewer, the mom of five FCPS students. The committee appointment to the Student Health Committee is very important as it gives the ability to the students to have a voice of inclusion for their physical and mental health. As the mom of a trans student, I am here to ask you to implement the guidelines that you put forth a couple years ago. The case-by-case -case approach only leaves the possibility of harm to a student. You can say that it hasn't happened here, but it did happen a few miles to our south. The teachers didn't have the guidance, and a girl was left on the bleachers while a lockdown drill occurred. She sat there as the teachers were trying to figure out what was the best practice in the situation because there was no guidance from their district. My child has been harmed in this district. She's fully recovered physically, but those wounds are definitely evident and her less than enthusiastic desire to fully participate in her school like all the other students. What's to stop it from happening again? What trans students need from you is implementation of the guidance. The, you, you guys can wait for the courts, but that likely won't happen. And then they'll be standing here at your mercy. What do I tell my daughter? We live in one of the most progressive areas and it doesn't feel that way when people fight the existence of your child and acceptance that their school is only on a case-by-case -case basis. We all know that the mental health of students should be in the forefront, and this is why we need you to stand up and make the right choice for acceptance of all FCPS students. When trained staff, SROs, and mediators are leading, the kids will have the ability to feel welcomed when they walk in each morning. They'll be able to fully participate in clubs and sports and feel valued by the schools that they attend. Thank you. Mr. Rigby. Good evening, school board members, Dr. Raybrand, and leadership team. You are beginning the process of selecting materials for the language arts curriculum for high school. I would encourage the committee members to look for materials that are, in, that are inclusive of LGBTQ people. In these times, messages of inclusion are particularly important, and let me give some examples why. Let me describe two things that have happened in the past few weeks in our area from which transgender, intersex, and gender expansive people and their parents are reeling. First, in a Stafford County Middle School, the staff delayed sheltering the students in a PE class because they did not know in which locker room to put a transgender girl. She was left outside in a hallway. The basic inhumanity of Stafford's policies that segregate transgender students was exposed for what it really is. The good news is that Stafford has already begun to change its policies. Stafford says, we work with transgender students on a case-by-case -case basis. That's very close to what Fairfax says. The reality is that the staff just didn't know what to do because they had conflicting directions from the higher ops, including their school board. I would hope that the same thing couldn't happen here, 
but our staff also receive conflicting messages. I and some others know that Fairfax does not necessarily segregate trans kids, but the vast majority of staff have no direction. The last action you took as a school board was to suspend the regulations that gave us direction. So what are we supposed to do? I know what to do. Uh, you need to tell everybody. The teachers in Stafford were winging it, and their wing broke. We need to take steps to see that similar things do not happen here. The other horrifying event this week was that the federal government is planning on erasing transgender people in the workplace, in the marketplace, and in education. Most of us spent the last week crying and hugging our loved ones and friends. Um, I, I particularly worry about health benefits for our employees uh, and their dependents. Um, a clear statement of support for all children from the school board and for their employees as you offered in a similar crisis, federal crisis back in February of 2017, would be very much appreciated. Thank you for listening. Ms. Bay. Thank you, board members and Superintendent Brayban, for this opportunity to speak tonight and for the work that you do on behalf of our county. My name is Jenny Bay, and I'm a mom to three beautiful kids who are very fortunate to be growing up in Fairfax County. And they're also very lucky to attend a school that is ranked among the best. We couldn't ask for better teachers, a principal, or assistant superintendent. Today, I'm advocating for every Fairfax County special ed student. Each student in special ed has an individualized education plan, an IEP. It's a contract that outlines how much and what kind of support they'll receive so that they can be successful in school. I'm here tonight because even in Fairfax County, we fall short of those resources for special ed. Schools are allocated resources and they have to fulfill every child's IEP hours with what they get. Now most schools can get it done, but they get it done on paper. Eight students with different IEPs in the same grade are put into one class. One special ed teacher goes into that classroom for one hour and works with those eight different students. And now legally, we've had one hour of all of their IEPs fulfilled. But can you tell me that we are providing these students a quality education? Or are we just giving them enough to get us by? We are not staffing our schools based on our students' needs. We are limiting the quality of their education because of our staffing, and that's not what we are about. We are Fairfax County. We are better than most districts in this nation. But do not make the mistake of thinking that just because we're better, that we're doing our best. Our special ed ratios are lower than the state requirements, but these mandated ratios are the bare minimum. Being slightly above is okay, but it is not great. Special ed allocation is determined by a staffing committee that depends on numbers, because what else can they use? They can't read every IEP, so X number of kids equals X number of resources. And each student's unique situation now becomes obsolete and they become a number. So my request to you is simple. Re-evaluate how we allocate special ed resources. Find a way to consider each child's unique needs. Two different schools with 50 st special ed students, on paper it makes sense to give them the same number. But if you reduce them to a number, you're not doing them justice. Give the people who know them, who know their needs, to give their input, not after the allocation, but during the decision process. Then we're not just meeting IEP hours on paper, we are actually giving them a quality education. Implement one fair facts, equity for everyone to succeed. And I think we can do it if we work together. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Gillette Millard followed by Ashley Broadway Mack and Norman Hall. Before I start, though, I just want to thank Beverly again, who's always so patient and helpful. And, okay. Anyway, start rolling the clock. <laughs> Good
Good evening, Superintendent Braban, School Board. This evening I wish to address committee appointments and in particular appointments to the School Health Advisory Committee. According to the website, FCPS School Board hereby charges the School Health Advisory Committee with examining and evaluating wellness metrics and making recommendations and with examining factors that impact students' social emotional health. I note that members of the School Health Advisory Committee represent various areas of student health, physical health, diet, psychological counseling, family, and community engagement. However, I do not see a person on that committee who is knowledgeable about the impact of mega school campuses. Fairfax County is blessed to have so many wonderful schools, but we are also unfortunately we have many large mega school campuses. I'm going to refer to an article by Stella Morabito referring to the mega schools and how they incubate mental instability in kids. I'm only gonna to touch on some of her points. You all will have uh, access to the full article. She writes, the correlation between mega school environments and the de deteriorating mental health of children has been intensifying for decades. Consider how common it is for high school today to house thousands of teenagers. For most of their waking hours for four solid years, mass schooling is increasingly unhealthy for kids' emotional stability in the following ways. The size and model of mass schooling is alienating. Back in 1929 to the 30s, there were about 250,000 public schools in the United States. By 2013, the number had shrunk to 98,000. Meanwhile, the U.S. population had nearly tripled. So you can see where we are packing in large number of students into one school. Mega schools are abnormal settings. Dr. Peter Gray at Boston College studied in depth the harmful effects of mass schooling on children's mental health and makes the point that school is simply an abnormal setting for children, mega, mega schools. There, there's a, a lot of points that she makes, and I, I think one of them, though, is also relevant to some of our people here tonight, which is um, there are no universal policies against bullying in mega schools that would afford all students equal protection. So as a result, um, schools kind of pick and choose which groups get a, uh, added protection by identity group and et cetera. There is a campaign, It Gets Better, which protects exclusively LGBT kids. If a child's parent, however, if a child's parents are not on board with the transgender social engineering project, they can lose custody of their children. A recent Ms. case Millard, in Ohio. Your yes? time is up. You have three minutes, and you've used oh. all three minutes. So if you would like to. Um, Oh, I was just okay. finishing. I was oh, just okay. going to wind up and say thank you for thank your you. wonderful attention and for keeping time. That is so helpful. Thank I you. was watching this and I was going to end, but thank you so much for taking the time to tell me my time was thank up. Thank you, Ms. Millard. It's most, most appreciated. Ashley Broadway Mack, followed by Norman Hall and Kelly Penzon. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you for um, allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Ashley Broadway Mack. I'm the proud mother of two elementary age Fairfax County um, students in the Lee District. I'm a military spouse of over 20 years and a former elementary and middle school teacher myself. Um, I'm here tonight to publicly voice the importance of the committee appointment to the Student Health Committee. This committee gives our students a voice for inclusion. Just a few short days ago, it was announced that the federal government is considering a drastic policy government-wide, a policy that would roll back recognition and protections of transgender people under federal civil rights law. We can't wait for the higher courts to make decisions when lives are at stake here in our district. We cannot sit by idly and allow children to be made victims and hurt because who are they are, are, does not appear on the surface to fit with the confines of gender boxes or roles as cisgender people define them. As parents, we love our children. As teachers, 
We love all of our children. Their safety and their well-being should be and remain our highest concern. Transgender children are not any different because they identify differently from the sex assigned at birth. Therefore, they should never be treated differently. Not now, not ever. Our children all need the same things in the school environment to feel safe, to be educated, and to be treated fairly. As my family prepares for retirement after decades of service to this country, choosing to retire here primarily because of this school dis system, this school district, it is our hope that Fairfax County Public Schools will support and protect all students, all families, all staff members. We as a community cannot leave any one group vulnerable. Thank you for your time. Mr. Hall, followed by Kelly Penzon. Good evening, Dr. Braybrand, Chairman Corbett Sanders, members of the school board. I'm Norm Hall, speaking as an individual citizen tonight. The views I express are those of my own self. I'm here to speak about FCPS strategic planning and special education for the more than 14% of students who have disabilities. At the last school board meeting, the topic of resource stewardship was on the agenda, and several student, uh, citizens spoke as parents of students who are in special ed. As I have noted in the past, there are many, many positives in how FCPS does special ed. We heard a parent express that view again tonight, and that's great. But if every child, every need is the standard, then it seems to me that leaving special ed out of your strategic plan documents means that you think we are on track, or you make sure that they include specific overall improvement goals, or you call for specific rates of measurable improvement. I think these are your choices. As things stand, none of the four strategic plan components have specific benchmark gains or rates of improvement that are to be expected. I note with dismay that the resource stewardship presentation, which was to have been discussed at your last work session, was not even posted before your last school board meeting for our community to respond to it. Now, there are data gaps concerning experiences of students with disabilities within the strategic plan, and also a woeful lack of data supporting the work of the joint efforts with the Fairfax County successful child and youth policy team with respect to special ed. So what am I saying? I'm calling for increased involvement of the community to address these needs. There are many individuals who can assist FCPS in the meaningful review of strategic elements with an eye towards student success. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Penzon. Good evening. Thank you for letting me have this time to address y'all. My name is Kelly Pinstone, and my husband and I are the proud parents of two sons. Our oldest is a senior, and our youngest is in the fourth grade. I'm here this evening to talk about the continued concern that we and so many other parents have regarding the ongoing efforts of FCPS, the Family Life Education Program, and other activist lobbying groups who want to brainwash our children. I'm talking about concepts which are not based on science, but are based rather on ideologies, ideologies that are not in agreement with the observable, repetitious, and universal natural laws of science. For example, one of the ideologies to which I refer to is the notion that sex is assigned at birth. But it's not just the false concept of what is being taught, it is the manner in which it's being foisted on our innocent, unsuspecting children. The process by which the FLE curriculum has been adopted, which is based on input from the highly biased aberrant CECAS, Planned Parenthood, Gleason, and the UN Comprehensive Sex Education Program. It's a corrupt process. I have three questions for y'all. I know y'all are unable to answer them this evening, but I'd like them on record. Number one, do you see that by teaching an ideology 
as scientific fact, you're undercutting a child's ability to make sense of the world around them based on their own natural abilities to observe and to think things through. Number two, when you introduce age-inappropriate sex education materials, you're subliminally normalizing topics which are not develop developmentally, which they're not developmentally prepared for and which they do not need. Um, one example is introducing the topic of sexually transmitted diseases to fifth graders. They're only by uh, nine and 10 years old, and I don't think this is necessary. Number three, shouldn't you be supporting education that respects the human mind rather than attempting to coerce it? We all know that children, especially the very young, are extremely susceptible to conditioning of their minds. And the truth is, by allowing a lot of the current sex ed materials to be introduced, you're an engaging, you're an engaging, you are engaging in conditioning and programming of their minds. This is not true education, but rather coercive thought reform. I want to refer to Margaret Thaler Singer book, Singer's book, Cults in Their Miss, and the chapter on the Continuum of Influence and Persuasion. I put the link in my statement, and then I've also given you all a two-page summary. I think you'll find the comparison between the five processes of education, advertising, propaganda, indoctrination, and thought reform to be very interesting and useful in your work to provide true education. There's also some good lessons in the family life education program, I agree. But please, I just, I'd like you to look at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you to all of the uh, citizens who have come out to speak with us tonight. I now call on Mr. Tignor for student representative matters. I'd like to repeat that as well. Um, thank you guys all for coming out and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a few things to talk about tonight and a bunch of notes, so forgive me if I sort of scramble my thoughts a little bit. Um, the first sort of topic is a personal matter and personal as regards to my friends matter. Um, as a senior, I'm applying to colleges, and there's a lot of seniors out there in our county who are as well applying to colleges. And even if you're a junior or a sophomore or beneath that, there's a lot of stress to get your grades up there to be presentable to these colleges you might be applying to in the future. And, and you know, kids know this too. And we put a lot of pressure on ourselves when we look out there. And when you come home after a day of school and you get a bad grade on your essay or something, and you turn in for history, uh, which happened to me on Tuesday, and you tell your parents about it, um, and they ask you to leave the room because they don't want to talk to you about the grade, it really hits hard. Right? So this happened to me uh, this week. It happened to a friend of mine almost every day this week. And I'm asking parents to be aware uh, of the pressure you put on your child when you say these kinds of things. You know, we're not oblivious to our futures, we understand our futures, and we know what we like, hopefully, and if not, we know that we at least want to be happy, right? So, instead of perhaps yelling at them or putting them down for that grade, instead ask them what they can do differently to improve. And this is sort of embodying that uh, present, not past mindset of parenting. Uh, and when you uh, sort of adopt this, uh, it actually applies to a theory of Taoism that I learned about this week in history class, the same class that I got that bad grade on in the essay. Um, so this is a quote from Lao Tzu. He's an ancient uh, Chinese philosopher who founded Taoism. Um, and it's about living in harmony with oneself and others. Uh, so he said, uh, if you are depressed, you are living in the past. If you are anxious, you are living in the future. And if you're at peace, you are living in the present. I'm not asking you guys to convert to Taoism, uh, but uh, this, is a, this quote carries an important message to keep in mind uh, when helping your child through the difficult years of high school. Um, you know, keep your child's mental and physical health uh, in mind just as much, if not more, than you do their grades and academic performance. Uh, it's difficult to raise a child, but um, as I'm sure you know as well, as people who've gone through school, it's also difficult to be a child too. Um, moving on from all that, uh, talking about sleep. Sleep is really important too. Um, of course, you hear it all the time. If you're growing mine, you should get at least eight hours a night. It's really tough to do. I don't do that. I wish I could do that. Um, and a lot of my friends can't. For 12th graders, uh, only 16% get eight or more hours of sleep a night. 25% uh, get five or less. So it's, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, there's going to be a Facebook Live video coming out early November about uh, the benefits and all these kinds of positives about getting more sleep and how it'll affect you. And, I uh, plead you guys to go look at that when it comes out. 
Um, I had an SAC meeting uh, last week, and we, I talked to all these different uh, students there. There are four elected from every high school in Fairfax County. Uh, they're some of the most hardworking, focused, and productive people I know. But even these kids, right, when I ask them to pull out their phone, uh, you can go into part of your settings if you have an iPhone and check out screen time, spent between, on average, the most five to six hours a day on their phone. And if you can just take maybe half of that time, two and a half, three hours, and apply it to your sleep, then you can get up closer to that eight hour mark. And that's really important to think about. Uh, also, election day is coming up, right? November 6th, uh, have a plan. Uh, for how you can get to your local election center and at what time you will be there. And if uh, you have a child who's 18 as well, make sure they know what they're going to do as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Tigner, for your wise words. Now, this section of the meeting is the confirmation of action taken in closed meeting. This is the portion of the meeting where the board will confirm any action regarding issues that were discussed in the closed meeting. These issues may include action taken regarding student disciplinary matters. Board members have discussed each individual case, and it is this time, at this time that we will make several motions to confirm the recommended action. I now call on Ms. Derenak Kofax for a motion. I move to deny the school reassignment appeal of a student who was charged with and convicted of serious criminal offenses related to a community-based incident and to confirm the disciplinary decision of the division superintendent. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Keyes Gamara. All those in favor? And that motion is unanimous with Ms. Schultz and Mr. Wilson away from the table. I now, now call on Ms. Evans for a motion. I move to deny the school reassignment appeal of a student who stalked a fellow student at school and to confirm the disciplinary decision of the division superintendent. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? And that is with Ms. Strauss, Ms. Evans, Ms. Keyes, Gamara, Mr. Moon, Ms. Derenak Kofax, Mr. McElveen, Ms. Palchik, Ms. Hines, and Ms. Corbett Sanders. Those opposed? Those abstaining? And that is with Ms. McLaughlin. That motion passes with Ms. Schultz and Mr. Th uh, Wilson away. I now call on Ms. Evans for a motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move to grant in part the school reassignment appeal of a student who possessed illegal drugs and also consumed and distributed alcohol at school and to modify the disciplinary decision of the division superintendent. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Ms. Strauss, Ms. Evans, Ms. Keyes Gamara, Mr. Moon, Ms. Aronak Kofax, Mr. McElveen, Ms. Palchik, Ms. Hines, and Ms. Corbett Sanders. Those opposed? Those abstaining? Abstention by Ms. McLaughlin. That motion passes with Ms. Schultz away from the table as well as Mr. Wilson. I now call on Ms. Strauss for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to authorize a settlement of a special education matter according to the terms and conditions outlined by legal counsel in closed session. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? And that motion is unanimous with Ms. Schultz away from the table. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedures, Robert's rules, provide for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through the board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. Item 6.01, approve the minutes of the September 27 and October 11, 2018 regular meetings. Item 6.02, confirm the separations for the period beginning September 1, 2018 and ending September 30, 2018. 
6.03, confirm the appointments and separations for the period beginning July 1, 2018 and ending September 30, 2018. Item 6.04, award a contract for the Robinson Secondary School Roof Replacement Project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, R.D. Bean, Inc., in the amount of $503,210 and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. Item 6.05, that Mrs. Keyes Gamara, at large school board member and school board members from Braddock and Drainsville shall select committee appointees to the High School Language Arts Basal Instruction Materials Adoption Committee as detailed in the agenda item. 6.06, .06, appoint individuals to serve on committees as detailed in the agenda item. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Ms. Keyes Gamara. I just wanted to um, acknowledge that the Ms. Keys Gamar has already submitted her committee person. <laughs> Thank you. Hearing and seeing no objection, objection, the consent agenda is approved. Seven, new business. The following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote tonight on these items, but action is scheduled at a future meeting. 7.01, board award a contract for the Annandale Terrace Elementary School renovation project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. Item 7.02, Award a contract for the Laurel Ridge Elementary School roof replacement project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. Item 7.03, award the contract for the running track replacement at South County High School to Field Turf USA. Uh, in the amount of $335,013 and authorize the division superintendent or assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. Now I call on Dr. Brabrand for superintendent matters. Thank you, Chairman Corbett Sanders. A couple of things I wanted to share. I was delighted to go out and uh, up here at Thomas Jefferson's uh, School of Science and Technology for the PTA's Family and Community Engagement Conference. I got to go with Sandy Evans and Sharon Bulova was there, Chairman of the County Board of Supervisors. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, Saturday afternoon to talk about how we can get families better connected to our schools and school district. Uh, Nina Thomas from the FCPS Office of Professional Learning and Cultural Responsiveness did the keynote. And we had workshops on engaging military families, effective two-way communication, special ed updates, parent liaison and community outreach, information about Title I schools. And they were well attended and we want to continue to partnership with the PTA around these kind of issues. Was also excited to see Genesis work, Works, which we've been partnering with for some time. Recognized many of our uh, young folks at the National Press Club on October 16th and they, were, they honored us as Community Partner of the Year. They're involved in D.C. Public Schools and in Fairfax. And we really give kids who are really the first generation of college-going kids the opportunity to have internships with blue chip companies around the Washington area. And we are excited about the work we're doing with them and look forward to continuing it. Um, I also had a chance to attend. We noted Edu Futuro. We had a, they had a... Uh, uh, a dinner and a scholarship recognition, and they also recognized one of our own, Deidre Lavery, who's an outstanding principal for her leadership in lifting up Latino families uh, and partnering with Edru Futuro, so we're really proud of her. Finally, Mr. Tignor, I listen to you every night, but tonight, more than ever, I am touched both as a father and as an individual human being. As a father, I learned um, about one of my own children about a grade that maybe I was surprised to hear about and what would I say. And last night what I said was, I just want you to do your best. And in the end, the grade doesn't matter if you've done your best. And I think we've got to figure out how to continue to have in a system that is devoted to excellence to give room for kids to be less than perfect. 
but to do their very best. So that is powerful. I want you to know that it spoke to me as a father and as an educator. You also spoke to me about getting sleep. I have had a flu or I've had a cold for the last three days. Uh, I've gone to see my doctor, so I'm working on um, making sure I'm taken care of. And with permission, uh, Madam Chair, I would like to leave after my superintendent matters. I have out-of-town travel tomorrow, and I want to get my eight hours of sleep and uh, be ready for uh, the uh, engagements that my travel requires. So I hope you will indulge my request. Dr. Braben, go <laughs> home, feel better. Okay. And I know that if uh, we need anybody, you have the dream team behind you. Yes, and the... Mr. Smith and uh, Mr. Dur uh, Dr. Duran are perfectly capable of filling in. Uh, absolutely. And I uh, send you my best wishes, and I'll, I'll see you soon. Next on the agenda is board reports. And I call on Ms. Evans for a report on the Governance Committee. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, we met this week and uh, completed our work on a recommendation on advocacy letters, which, um, which we will bring to the governance work session on Monday, October 29th. Uh, we've okay. also completed our work on uh, professional development funds. That was a forum topic that was brought to us um, a while back, and so we have a recommendation on, on that as well. Um, we um, did a very brief uh, debrief of the retreat, and we're going to bring some recommendations to the board of, about um, using a similar approach at our work sessions to um, ask that everybody stick to uh, three minutes um, on their first round. So uh, we are going to bring that to the board. Uh, another recommendation we're going to make is that the meeting managers go to the end of the table um, opposite the staff members so they can see other board members uh, seeking recognition. Uh, so those are a couple of things that, that uh, we're, we're going to suggest. Uh, we also, um, Ms. McLaughlin is going to bring us uh, some ideas before our next meeting on how we might uh, better approach bringing issues to the board. Uh, this also was a forum topic um, of Ms. McLaughlin's, and so we are going to consider ideas um, and uh, with the idea of, of bringing some suggestions to the full board. We are continuing to work our way through the strategic governance manual and uh, just doing a little bit at a time, and we hope to have that wrapped up in a couple months, maybe, <laughs> to be optimistic. Thank you, Ms. Evans. <laughs> I now call on Ms. McLaughlin for an audit committee update. Thank you. Um, audit committee met yesterday uh, for two hours, and uh, what we covered uh, was not only just an update on where we were on the, the audit work plan, uh, but we uh, had a review of the local school activities funds, and uh, that uh, totals in millions of dollars every year. So. Uh, it's our understanding that there were about 15 schools where uh, they felt there was notable um, areas um, in need of improvement. And so uh, that uh, staff will be working directly um, with those schools on there. Um, we also, as an audit committee, uh, asked our auditor general that in the future um, there would be some more context for these schools where they were doing local activity fund reviews, uh, asking for ranking the seriousness or classifying um, what some of the areas of concern were. Um, then we also uh, talked about um, just ways in which we could enhance the school board's awareness of the work that's being done by the Office of Auditor General. And so the audit committee uh, unanimously uh, asked that uh, I bring to uh, the chair and vice chair uh, a request that uh, the auditor general have a, a formal standard annual reporting out and um, meeting with the board um, about the work of the Office of Auditor General along with a mid-year standing um, annual report um, and presentation to the board. And then if there are any other individual reports that are done by the audit committee, I mean, done by the Office of Auditor General that the 
audit committee believes rises to the level of importance for the board's deeper review um, that we, the committee, would bring that uh, to both the chair and vice chair to schedule for a work session. And the goal is that uh, we recognize that there are any number of reports uh, that are of high public interest. Uh, so being able to uh, ensure that the board um, has the opportunity to get that type of deeper uh, briefing, uh, such as like uh, the contracts audits uh, will be coming in December, uh, that, that there can be high risk there to the division. And so uh, once uh, it's presented to the, uh, again, the audit committee, uh, we can then uh, look to the board and say, if you want to have uh, greater details for yourselves. There's really quite a number of fascinating reports that the audit um, Office of Auditor General has done, including things like the online campus audit. Um, so those were kind of the highlights of uh, what we talked about at yesterday's audit committee meeting. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, Mr. Moon left. He seems to have the same um, flu-like symptoms that Dr. Braybrand have. So I will just give a quick debrief of the forum that we held earlier this evening. The forum uh, was brought to us by Mrs. Schultz and then had some additional information brought to us by Mrs. Keyes Gamara. And the focus of the forum was to set as a priority the development of an employee's rights and responsibilities handbook. This is something that um, there's been some topic, some discussion over, about it over the past um, few months, but uh, we welcomed Ms. Schultz's uh, focus and prioritization of the ER&R um, and working, we've asked the assistant superintendent for HR to set this as a priority, working with the ER&R and Title IX teams to uh, develop a handbook and the um, uh, complementary uh, professional development to uh, bring that to us sometime in the spring. Uh, they'll work with, Dr. Brabrand will work with the chair and vice chair to get it on our schedule. And the ER&R document will um, provide greater clarity and guidance to employees um, on the standards of conduct for uh, bullying, discrimination, abuse, sexual misconduct, and uh, be it physical or verbal in nature, as well as online communications. Uh, also uh, be very specific on the response for um, approaches to Title IX violations as well, and uh, that passed unanimously from the board uh, to set that as priority. Now we come to board matters. I call on Ms. Strauss. Thank you. Um, I have been in the process of visiting all the schools who serve students in the Drainsville District. And so far I've been to uh, Thomas Jefferson, Langley, McLean High School, Cooper Middle School, um, Clearview Elementary, Churchill Road Elementary, Hutchison Elementary, Forestville Elementary, and Lemon Road. And um, I want to thank the principals for their hospitality and uh, great conversations about um, the things that we need to continue to do and improve and uh, bring to support them in, in their goals and their schools. I also want to thank the, uh, the teachers and the children whose classrooms I visited. And I was very pleased to see excellent teaching and learning going on. I especially enjoyed seeing math workshop, reading workshop. Um, and uh, excellent collaborative work and discussions among children uh, with their reading, their writing, and with their math. I saw some very interesting classroom work at McLean High School where students um, uh, are grouped and discussing more about uh, what they're learning in math and this higher math, how they uh, uh, strategize to uh, solve problems. So um, it was very... Uh, very enlightening, and in, a couple, in the next couple of weeks, I hope to get to all the rest of the school. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Schultz. 
So I want to thank everybody who attended to my, um, I had two citizen town halls, one at West Springfield High School and one at Centerville High School to cover the expanse of my district. Um, I see Ms. Tina Williams here. I want to thank her for attending one of those. Um, they were excellent. Um, a lot of emphasis uh, just from my colleagues at Occupation on concerns having to do with split feeders, on concerns having to do with boundaries, on special education. Um, thank you, Norm, for your comments this evening. Um, uh, related to um, online campus opportunities and whether um, the online campus version that is uh, self-moderated for things like the personal finance versus a teacher. And there was really a more of a consensus that the one that um, provides access to a teacher, a live teacher, is the best way for us to approach online education. And a lot of discussion around um, FCPS on versus off um, and concerns related to increased screen time for children, especially at the younger ages. I wanna thank the PTA presidents who attended my PTA presidents roundtable. That's the first of a series that'll run over the course of the academic year. Uh, and um, in particular, um, those who, who stood in the stead of their, their PTA presidents who were unable to attend. That was a very robust and helpful conversation as I go forward over the course of this uh, academic year serving. Um, I do want to acknowledge he left this evening. I heard Dr. Braybrand mention to Benny um, the stress that students are under. I too am a parent of a senior this year. Um, this time is brutal. Um, if you aren't um, working on college applications, you're looking for scholarships, or you're trying to fit in one last college visit, um, I've run into a bunch of you on those college visits myself. Um, it, it will be okay. There are 3,500 colleges and universities in this country. Um, if you don't get into one or two or three of your favorites, um, there's someplace else. You'll be fine. Um, uh, you know, and I'm saying that to myself as well, to be self-assured. <laughs> um, all, all will be well. Um, I do want to acknowledge the opioid um, legislation that was, or, or the, the signature document that, that came out this week. We are, unfortunately, in a county where um, students are facing um, stress, and there is um, access to a lot of prescription medication at home. Um, I have just heard, actually, I believe he's a Fairfax County resident, and um, uh, I'm not exactly sure what his capacity is, and he has developed a, um, a packet that goes inside um, a medicine bottle, and then you put a little bit of water in, and it turns your, your medication into something that is now unusable, and then it doesn't pollute the water streams and all kinds of things, and it helps make medication safe. This is something that... Uh, you know, parents have to be aware of, um, students have to be um, advocating for not only for yourselves, but your peers um, who may be struggling. Uh, please don't be afraid to speak up, um, but don't turn to prescription medication or, or other things um, to deal with the stress. Let, let's, let's help you find a way um, to get through this a, a, a lot better and have you be healthier. And I just want to thank Benny and, and Absentia for his comments this evening. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I do want to make another comment about the forum, and I appreciate you, just as a course of a regular business, you, um, the chair or the vice chair gives a, a rundown of a forum topic. This is important. Um, it's particularly important for a number of communities um, which I represent. Uh, the forum topic very specifically was for the board to direct the superintendent um, as a result of our conversation to undertake an employee, just like the students sign a student's rights and responsibilities document every year. You sign it annually and your parents have to sign it as well. Um, we have 40,000 employees, full-time and part-time, and the employees need to be able to sign that as well with the priority focused on um, outlining expected behavior from, from us as a board and from the division pertaining to adults and their interaction with minor children um, related to verbal, physical, um, sexual harassment, bullying, intimidation, um, assault, abuse, 
um, the works. What you should do if you're an adult, what, um, if, you, if you become aware of it, what you should not be doing, what the expected behavior is, uh, what the clear expectations are for reporting, and I'm very thankful to Helen Nixon, our new Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, and Catherine Carroll, our new Title IX Director, for participating in the leading up discussions. Um, it's gonna take us a little bit of time to work on this, but it is time that there be a lot of clarity for our employee force, and a lot of clarity for our families that we are speaking very clearly on the subject. And um, I think tonight's forum topic um, is a good step forward in us being much more definitive and clear in giving employees resources in one place and then having an annual renewal going forward um, that will result from staff work. So I appreciate everybody's cooperation in that regard. Ms. Evans. Uh, thank you. I want to uh, say how pleased I was to attend the Taste of Annandale a couple of Saturdays ago. It was a, a great event, and it gets bigger and better every year with uh, more and more participants and uh, performances, and it, it spilled over into uh, a new area this year. So congratulations to all of the people who organized that, that great event, and uh, it's always great to see the Annandale High School students and PTA uh, and principal participate in that as well. Um, I, as Dr. Braybrand said, I was very pleased to um, participate in the FCC PTA's Facing the Future conference on uh, family engagement this last Saturday, and in particular to serve on a panel to discuss equity uh, with Dr. Braybrand and um, Chairman Bulova uh, there as well, as, as well as our new ombudsman, uh, Armando Perry. Uh, I think that was a good introduction of our ombudsman to um, uh, members, some, some very active members of our community, and it was a great discussion, um, as well as uh, interesting workshops that um, people were very engaged in in the whole uh, conference. So that was uh, wonderful to attend. I uh, appreciate uh, joining the Tyson's Partnership and the Foundation for Fairfax County today in celebration of the. Uh, shoes for Kids um, uh, event today. Uh, this is where they collect, um, well, last year they collected shoes, and this year they focused more on collecting money with which to buy shoes, but they had focused on seven elementary schools. Ms. Palchuk was uh, there as well. Uh, both of our schools were uh, benefit, uh, benefited from this effort. Uh, Bailey's Upper at Bailey's Primary in Woodburn, as well as Timberlane, Graham Road, Shrevewood, and Freedom Hill. And I know that this is, uh, it's, it's uh, very much appreciated in those communities that uh, children who otherwise would be wearing uh, shoes that are very worn out or simply don't fit anymore, now will have brand new shoes. Uh, so thank you to, uh, to that partnership for, and it's, it's, still, um, it's still ongoing. Uh, anybody who wants to, to um, contribute, it's there. And thank you also to the Dunloring Fire Station for hosting the, the lunch. Uh, and, and last but certainly not least, I, uh, Mr. Tigner, I certainly can uh, support your cry for more sleep. Um, as everyone on this board knows, that's been uh, something that I've advocated for since 2004. Uh, we made progress um, on this board uh, by, by creating later start times a couple of years ago, but we, we still have work to do. Clearly, we still have work to do. And the, the, um, the data that, that you cited from the youth survey is, uh, the last time I looked, uh, it was improving, but uh, not to the extent that we would like, because it's still very, very difficult. And we also still have to look at middle schools. Um, we, we have um, our middle schools, we, we still need to work on that. And as far as the the other issues that you raised, thank you for, for uh, talking about those as well. Uh, this is something that our board cares about deeply, the, the issue of stress and anxiety. I know uh, as liaison to the, the School Health Advisory Committee, that's something that, that they uh, continue to focus on and would, would like for us to uh, take some, some specific actions, which uh, we'll, we'll be discussing later. So thank you for raising that. I think it's... Uh, uh, it's something that we need to focus on quite a bit. And yes, I, and also uh, to remind people to go out and vote uh, in a couple of weeks too. I don't think we have a, another board meeting. So yes, vote on November 6th. 
Ms. Keyes Gamara. I'll give a, a quick summary um, rather than go through all my activities. But uh, I also want to thank our student rep for his um, wise words with respect to guidance for parents. Um, we're only thinking about guidance for our students, but um, how we set the tone in our homes oftentimes helps our kids to look at school in the proper perspective and to find their best, best ser selves rather than um, the extensive level of stress that's available to them. So I really appreciated those comments. Um, I was also uh, glad to see a forum topic that Ms. Schultz brought and um, was um, happy to add to the topic with respect to how we address um, sexual misconduct, bullying, and things of that nature. And so I think we had a really good discussion as to how we can drill down and make it very clear to our community as to how we are dealing with these types of issues and, and other forms of discrimination. Um, because as parents, there are expectations to know and what you should expect should be very clear. And so um, I think it was a really good discussion and a really good step to begin to set out expectations to the superintendent to look at these issues very specifically. So I was happy to join um, Ms. Schultz in outlining priorities for that. Um, I also uh, was able to attend with Ms. Corbett Sanders a legislative meeting with the Board of Supervisors this week. Um, we kind of double teamed and she went another direction and I was able to stay and talk a little bit about the diversion program um, as well as the restorative justice types of things and um, particular um, matters that arise with respect to uh, disorderly conduct in our schools. And so I look forward to getting uh, additional reports as to how that is implementing, implemented. The good news is the number of arrests for that particular statute with respect to disturbing the peace is extremely low. Um, but we also want to make sure that um, there isn't like a, an escape shot uh, shoot with the disorderly conduct and make sure that we are re rehabilitating our children with respect to what may be developmentally appropriate behavior that is needs correction but not necessarily um, criminal take them into the criminal arena. Um, lastly, I'll end on discussing a taste of Annandale. I um, was able to shop at the farmer's market there from the Annandale High School yeah. PTA. So. Um, um, those items ended up in what I thought was a delicious soup. Nobody complained in my house. Um, <laughs> and so it was really fun and um, appreciated. So it's been good. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, I first want to touch on something that our student rep, um, Benny, um, shared this evening because as the parent of three high school students who uh, recently graduated over the last four years, um, I've not only cared about this as a social worker and a school board member, but also as a parent. And uh, Benny, all I can say is uh, I'm sorry that our division has not been more successful in what many of us have spoken about for years and years and years. And that's about the quality of assessments versus quantity. Um, when, when I first joined this board, along with many of my colleagues here at the table, this school system used to direct our teachers to do two graded assessments per week. That means 18 in a nine week quarter, 36 in a semester. There is no college course in this country that gives 36 graded assessments of its students. And yet for our kids who take IB and AP as well as honors and standard, that is volume. That's not, that's not quality. Um, we have since moved away over time. Um, our former superintendent created a task force. They looked at this. They incorporated over 200 teachers and stakeholders. But I don't think we got where we needed to because it was more guidance than a little bit more about standardization. And why I'm bringing this up is because this board has been so deeply committed to the whole child and to the mental health and well-being of, of students. Um, and to our employees as well. But we haven't gone the next step, which is how do you strategically get there and, and be more intentional with the work. And so I think, Benny, what I wanted you to know is that 
your voices as the students through the Student Advisory Council to the superintendent. I hope you feel incredibly empowered this year after you get through college applications um, to, to really help bring us even further of where we need to be. Um, one of the things, my colleagues, I want you to know is I'm sending out in, in my next fall newsletter the regulation again about homework. The science and the regulation within Fairfax County says 10 minutes per grade level and not to exceed two hours a night at the high school level. That's what our Fairfax County homework regulation says. That's based on following best practice. The Stanford Brain Research supports all of that, but I think we have to just become more united on it like we were on healthier school start times. So um, I, 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 I do think that's just so important. Kids can't get sleep if they've got volume of work to do. And for our teachers, they can't get sleep and the teachers can't get the, the rest they need to rejuvenate for the next day when they're grading all of that work. So I think this is a much about teacher sleep, teacher rest, teacher morale, as it is for our students. Um, in terms of what Dr. Brabrand said, Benny, I also really wanted to speak to this because when it comes to the letter grades, I think we all, again, at, with best of intentions, agree Every child in the school division should know, do your best work, and that's what, that's what counts. But there is another piece of this that I feel like we don't, as a division, talk about enough, and that's about ensuring that our grading practices are, are normative and match student mastery of material. And what I mean is that we have situations where students will get a five or maybe even a four on an AP exam, but they end up with a C in the class. And that's not, again, to draw criticism and place the pressure on the teachers, but the point being, as a division, we need to work with our teachers and with our administrators to do that kind of analysis and see where there's a disconnect between the letter grades earned to the test scores that are just an external measure. Because um, sometimes students will say at a macro level, we were all working really hard and doing our best, and they, they ended up with, you know, getting... C's, large number of students getting C's in, an, in a high performing class. And so I, I didn't want Dr. Brabrand's remarks to just go in a vacuum, which is, yes, there are times when you're doing your very best and you're being graded with, with accuracy, but I also want students to feel like when they see, especially collectively in a classroom, that the grades are very, very low to the performance of what those students' aptitude is, students need to speak up. And I've had students in the past who do that collectively, respectfully, and it has been a very positive outcome for the students and the teacher to ensure that we are grading students effectively because Anyone who's had their children applying to colleges, and they all range from highly selective to less selective, but the bottom line is the grades do matter. And I want to ensure every child feels like they have a voice to say, this grade doesn't reflect my mastery. And if it's on an individual level, the respectful dialogue with the teacher is so important. But if it's happening collectively in a classroom, and the kids are all looking at each other and saying, how come we were all A students last year and now we're all getting C's in an honors and advanced level course? That's, students should feel safe to be able to talk about that. So, um, you know, I, I, I apologize for going a little lengthy on that issue, but um, I think we just have more work we can be doing to help our students, not just say we care, but through action, help improve what we're doing. And I know, Benny, you had your hand up, so... Could he respond? Because he, I think he was trying to say something. Is that okay, Ms. Corbett Sanders? Um, the purpose of this look? section is really for individual board matters. When uh, I'll let His Mr. Turn. Tigner okay. finish. Okay. When, when your turn comes up, you'll get to <laughs> respond Go back. Ahead, um, just, just a couple more things I wanted to say to our citizens who came out to speak tonight. It's always very meaningful to us to hear your points of view. Um, and in particular, I appreciated the comments about special education tonight. Um, without question, all achievement gaps matter. And um, I wanna make sure, along with my colleagues' dedication, that the strategic plans that we have, the goal reports we do, 
will demonstrate that commitment and that focus. And so um, thank you for continuing to bring an important voice to this. So we're cognizant of what may not be communicated and we need to do a better job of that. And then um, uh, finally, I wanted to just share, um, many of my colleagues are aware, but Ms. Dernett Koufax and I serve on the Successful Children and Youth Policy Team. And we had a unique opportunity earlier this week to um, present on a one hour um, Fairfax Public Access television show called Inside Scoop about the five and a half years of what Skip has accomplished to date. And uh, it took a lot of prep because in five and a half years, surprisingly, a lot more has gone on in Skip than, than I think we even realized. And, and so it was, uh, to me, a very rewarding experience to share that with Ms. Darnett Koufax and uh, Catherine Reed, um, who leads that show and invited us. I'm appreciative because there is a lot to celebrate about Fairfax County Schools and Fairfax County government and its commitment to one Fairfax for ensuring each and every child can be successful. And there's words and then there's actions. And I think Skip is helping contribute to the actions on that. And so that was very positive. And then finally, I, I wanna share with my colleagues that during my office hours um, this past week, I am hearing concerns from our elementary school parents about what the one-to-one -one digital device will mean in terms of screen time in the classroom for, for elementary school age students. And so I, I wanna first thank you, my colleagues, because I felt at our work session, we were very mindful of that. And I just wanna reinforce that as we move on this FCPS on um, effort, it's gonna be so important that we, we do approach this with great care. Um, our students and families deserve nothing less. Ms. Derenak. In several community events over the past week, and I it was first of all wonderful to honor our teachers and our teams at the annual Excellence Awards. Um, while uh, the recipient's name was being called after that, we were taking pictures. We heard of so many amazing initiatives that they are involved with. It was just so very impressive. Um, I was also happy to meet with constituents at the Green Spring Retirement Community to talk about what's happening in our schools. That's a very engaged group, so it was wonderful to meet with them. I was also happy to attend the FEA's open house and dedication of their boardroom, honoring their former FEA president, Walt Micah. Uh, I had a great day with my colleagues, Mr. McElveen and Ms. Palchek, as we celebrated the seventh annual Real Food for Kids Food Day last Friday um, that happened at Lindbrook Elementary School and it was great to see all the students learning about and helping um, the chef and other people there to make healthy foods. Um, thank you to Principal Jay Nako for opening up your amazing school to us and to this for this tremendous program and thank you to Mary Porter and Joanne Hammermaster for your leadership at Real Foods for Kids for so many years. Um, I also uh, joined my colleague and other members of the community and the Board of Supervisors to celebrate the beginning of a pilot program at Walt Whitman Middle School and Mount Vernon Woods Elementary School where they are piloting a community schools model. I would like to thank the United Way for funding this project along with Opportunity Neighborhoods funding and for the United Community Ministries who will, man who will manage um, coordinators at each of the school. We're going to be doing a preliminary needs assessments and then see what can happen and hopefully this will be a model for other schools in the future. I too, as Ms. McLaughlin said, would like to thank Catherine Reed, who is the creator and host of a Fairfax public access program called Inside Scoop. She gave Ms. McLaughlin and I the opportunity, as she, as she had referenced, um, for an hour to talk about the successful children and youth policy team. And as Ms. McLaughlin said, uh, uh, for five years of work, it was wonderful to share some of the initiatives. We didn't even get through all of them, but um, what, how we are serving the broader community through the Skip group. Um, thank you to my colleagues um, for your meeting with staff and myself on our fiscal forecast and where direction you think the budget should go. Um, Janie and I have met with all but three of you and I know the last three of us are getting scheduled so I look forward to that. And yes, if you are old enough, please go out and vote on November 6. Mr. McElveen. 
Pass. Ms. Palchik. Um, very briefly, sometimes less is more. Uh, I want to thank my fellow board members. I think we had um, a very productive civil um, conversation. I appreciate those who helped lead it and organize our school board retreat last Thursday. I want to say that I came out of that feeling um, that we are partners moving together, and I hope we can continue that uh, as we move forward with our work, because that is critical um, to our students. I also want to thank Cub Scout Pack 1132 Den 4 um, for inviting me to talk about um, citizenship, and um, we had a got to learn how to do advocacy through their um, ideas such as having zip lines in schools. Uh, got to learn how you, <laughs> where you go and how you advocate for, uh, for topics like that. And finally, um, I want to thank Region 1 schools that I visited last week, including Waples Mill Elementary School with Sean Duffy here in the back, uh, and also looking forward to visiting some of my Region 2 schools. And um, those of you who are up an early Saturday morning before all those sports practices in the rain, I hope to see you at Panera right behind here at 8.30 for office hours. Thank you all. Get some sleep, Ben, and get some sleep. We need to stay healthy. Thank you. Ms. Hines, with the chair's indulgence, I would cede my time to Mr. Tignor. I will be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for, for your comments about students doing their best um, instead of uh, what the grade is itself, um, I think it's a, a very important thing to recognize uh, that that's perhaps more important, uh, but it's another thing uh, to acknowledge that that's very difficult to do uh, for a lot of students in high school. Uh, for example, that essay grade that I talked about, that was certainly not my best on that essay. And that's another reason why it struck home even more when my parents asked me to leave that room because I knew as well and I was disappointed in myself because I could have and should have done better. Um, the issue is that there are a lot of other factors that go in besides writing that essay that's due a couple weeks from now. Um, you know, it's, for us it was homecoming. You know, um, I had broken up uh, with someone over summer and that whole group, friend group was divided and I had no idea what to do if I was going to make a selfless or a selfish decision on that front and that was putting pressure on me and at the same time planning our homecoming dance and parade, homecoming parades tomorrow, Hunterswood Shopping Center come out, right? Um, but all that kind of stuff, there's a lot of different pressures that were on me. And of course, because of that, my time management wasn't as good as it should have been. Um, so I think it's, it's also very important not just to tell those parents to be lenient on them, but also tell the teachers to make sure they incentivize those students to do their best on those assignments. So keep those interest levels up, uh, make sure they want to do that assignment. And I think that's also very important. Thank you. Always wise words, so thank you, uh, Mr. Tigner, and thank you, Ms. Hines, for ceding your time. Um, I do have a couple of announcements. Uh, many of the uh, events that I attended have already been uh, mentioned, so I won't review those, but I will um, give a shout out to the Carl Sandburg Fine Arts Department. They had an incredible concert last Thursday, and I just felt very blessed to be able to attend it, and I left um, whistling the tunes, and so uh, it was a great event. Um, also had the opportunity to meet with the leaders of Voices in advance of their governor's uh, presentation over the weekend, and just welcome their continued involvement in our community to ensure that our underrepresented, commun underrepresented populations are well represented through a group such as Voices. Um, I want to call attention to the community that tomorrow morning from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., if you have extra coats, they would be welcome at the annual coat drive at the uh, Pendaw Fire Station. And on Saturday, although it may be a little damp, I know that Supervisor Stork will welcome all bike riders for the annual tour to Mount Vernon, which will be leaving Fort Hunt Park at 8.30 in the morning. And later in the day, in case you want to be drier, at Bucknell Elementary, we will be having a STEM festival uh, sponsored by the Magic of Mothers. And uh, on the 2nd of November, I'm going to encourage my colleagues to come out for the annual uh, Battle of the Highway, which is the football game where Mount Vernon High School competes against West, West Potomac High School. And so I 
have one go back. I'm sorry, Robinson Marketplace, Saturday, November 10th, nine to three. It is a not to be missed event. Thank and you, even if you don't Schultz. go, even if you don't go to Robinson, you can get all your Christmas shopping done or almost all of it done there. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>